Hello, my name is John Kelly and this is the Weber Auto YouTube channel. This video is the third in a series on the evolution of the Toyota Prius hybrid transaxle. As you can see sitting behind me here, I have a third generation Toyota Prius. This model went up for sale for the model years of 2010 through 2015. This third generation of Prius had some great improvements in the transaxle design and in the design of the, the engine and the vehicle itself. It also had some fantastic options, uh, some pretty high-tech options, the radar cruise control and lane departure warning and correction and, and a, a bunch of other uh, really cool things that were optional. Um, the fuel economy went up by almost five miles per gallon versus the second generation Prius. And I forgot to mention that in my other video, but the second generation Prius fuel economy went up by about five miles per gallon over the first generation Prius. So this third generation Prius has a very unique, totally redesigned transaxle called the P410. And I've got one that's totally disassembled over on the bench. We're going to go look at it look at the individual pieces, talk about them, and reassemble this transaxle uh, most of the way. So let's go take a look at it. Okay, right here on the bench I have the P410 transaxle from a 2010 Toyota Prius, third generation uh, Prius. This is the third generation hybrid transaxle also. Uh, this transaxle was used in more than just the Prius model itself. Uh, it was used in the Prius from 2010 through 2015. But then it was also used uh, from 2012 through 2015 in the Prius plug-in hybrid. Uh, so before the Prius Prime, there was a, pl a Prius plug-in hybrid. Uh, it was also used from 2012 until today, still 2017, if you buy a Prius V. So uh, the same transaxle is used in all three of those vehicles. Uh, the only difference that I'm, I'm aware of that I could find is on the Prius V, it has an additional cooling passage right here that on all of or on a regular Prius and on the Prius plug-in hybrid there's no plate that bolts on here and no coolant hoses that hook to it and no uh, coolant additional coolant pump to pump uh, coolant through it to help cool down the MG2 uh, rotor so on just a regular Prius like this one these passages are just open there's no coolant hoses hooked to them at all but if you look up the component list for a Prius V, you'll see there's a plate with two coolant hose fittings that connects right there. All right, while we're here uh, looking at the case, uh, model identification numbers. So on the previous first generation and second generation transaxles, the first generation transaxle had a three-digit code of a 2CM transaxle for the P111. The second generation uh, Prius transaxle had a code of a 3CM for the P112 transaxle. And if you look right here, you could see that this one reads 3JM. 3JM. Okay, so the P410 transaxle, which is the third generation Prius one has a three digit code of P or of 3JM which means it's the third generation of this transaxle design now this transaxle design is not unique to the Prius in 2010 as a matter of fact there's a more grown up larger version stronger version more powerful version of this that came in the 2006 Highlander hybrid uh, and its model number was a 1JM. Uh, so this is a 3JM. The transaxle model that was used in the 2006 and above Highlander Hybrid, 2006 through 2011, was the P310 uh, transaxle. And this is a P410 transaxle. So it's the next generation up. It, it 
is just a smaller version of the the same uh, transaxle. The P410 is actually identified with the, the designation of P410. If I tip it up here for you to, for you to see, you can see the in, cast in the case itself is the letter P and then 410 after that. So that identifies this as the P410. Now the first and second generation transaxles in the Prius, they did not have anything that identified them as the P111 or the P112, uh, other than the sticker when you open the driver's door. But this one and all subsequent ones that I've seen identify it on the transaxle itself. So the transaxle actually has two identification, um, at least two identification uh, designations. You've got this one that starts with the letter P, like the P. 410 and there's a p510 in the prius c and the p610 in the new prius and prius prime and then there's the three digit uh code the three jm two jm one jm whatever it may be for your tra that transaxle uh, somewhere else on the transaxle and of course there's serial numbers that i'm sure identify uh, what it is also all right, uh, let's take a look at a few other things here on the case. Let me get my cutaway piece stuck back in here. We have the park shift linkage right here that uses an electric motor to uh, control that, just like the second generation uh, Prius transaxle. Uh, here on the bottom of the transaxle case, uh, the bottom and the front of the bell housing portions, uh, we have some coolant passages to help cool the MG1 motor generator. Remember, that's the one that acts as a generator and also starts the internal combustion engine. We also have a transaxle uh, fluid drain plug. This transaxle uses the Toyota World Standard uh, transmission fluid, the WS fluid. So we've got a drain plug right there. Uh, we have a transaxle fluid level check plug. It's on the, the front side by the engine uh, on the front of the transaxle right here. And then we have a fill plug where you add fluid right here on the top portion where the CV shafts uh, connect. We've got a hole here for the three phase cables for MG2 uh, to come in right there and connect to it. Uh, here on the top of the transaxle, we have a, another hole for the three-phase cables for MG1 to connect. We've got our vehicle identification number uh, plate right here. We've got a transaxle vent right here. On the side cover of the, the transaxle, we've got the place for our oil pump and resolver for MG1, and we'll put that together here. Uh, in a little while. Uh, then we can separate the center case from the bell housing. Um, and just like we talked about in the other uh, transaxles, the, the P111 and the P112, there are pry points where uh, you can come in and get underneath the case half and, and pry up to separate those halves. Those case halves are not going to come apart that easily because they've got the Toyota Fipig, the form in place gasket um, sealer that makes it very difficult to get those apart. Uh, as I mentioned in the other videos, you want to make sure that when you're prying to separate the case halves that you do not scratch this mating surface where that sealant uh, has to seal. Okay, um, let's start the assembly of the transaxle. All right, on the center case half here, uh, I wanted to point out a few uh, things to begin with. First, our final drive ring gear is going to be spinning. Let's see, that's the front of the vehicle, so it's going to be spinning in, in this direction, which will fling oil up into these catch tanks. It'll gather in these uh, little reservoir areas which will drip uh, oil down into 
uh, different areas that need lubrication, the bearings, the gears, the stator windings, uh, the rotor, uh, and so on, to keep them lubricated and cool. Uh, the fluid level is at this point approximately. If we were to compare the fluid level check plug on the bell housing, this is the approximate height. So there's, it's got a pretty good volume of, of uh, fluid in here for how small the, the transaxle case is. Okay, uh, down here in the bottom of the case, we have a magnet. I've, it falls out quite easily, so for this demonstration, I've just put a piece of clear tape uh, over it, holding it uh, in place. Uh, we are going to have our oil pump suction uh, screen and tube come in right here uh, that will go through and connect to the back um, case, or, or that will go through and connect to the the side cover of the transaxle where the oil pump is. So we've got a screen and just a tube with an O-ring on it that bolts in, bolts in place here. Normally you wouldn't put that on until the side cover was already on. Uh, because you need to line that tube and o-ring up with the hole in the side cover uh, case but uh, I'm going to keep all three case pieces separate for this demonstration so we can talk about how it works and so I can show my my students uh, how it works all right uh, we also have uh, while we're right here the parking pawl linkage that needs to connect uh, as you can see right here, coming in and out, is the park linkage that needs to push on a parking pawl to engage with the parking gear. Um, the parking gear on this model is right here. It's these notches on this great big double ring gear, internal gear, as part of the planetary uh, gear sets that are used for part of what's called the power split device and the motor speed reduction uh, gear set and we'll talk about that how that works a little bit later but the parking pawl is going to come in and with this notch right here in the parking pawl come and engage right here in the gear and keep it from rotating. This gear connects to a transfer gear which connects to the final drive gear which connects to the tires. So if we stop this gear from rotating, which is what the parking pawl against the parking gear does, then the, then the vehicle uh, stops. So we've got some parking gear linkage that needs to be uh, connected up here. There's a steel sleeve that keeps the Park, the parking linkage from wearing itself out in the case itself. And then there's a little pin that holds a spring. The spring holds the parking pawl away from the parking gear. So we have to force the parking pawl to engage into the parking gear to hold the vehicle. Then we've got a little piece of uh, linkage bracket that will hold that pin and spring in place. Then we have the parking pawl itself that comes in below that spring, sits on top of the, the bracket where the parking linkage comes through, and then we have a pin, pivot pin, that holds it in place. So now if I move the, the lever up and down, you can see the parking pawl move in and out which is what it would do versus that parking gear uh, that I showed you uh, earlier. 
So that's the parking linkage. Um, then we have a little spring-loaded detent that will keep it in park once we've shifted to park. Remember, we've got an electric motor that moves this thing into park or not park. Um, there is no neutral. There is no drive or reverse as far as the linkage uh, positioning is concerned. And so right now, uh, that's in park. And if I move it down one notch, now it's not in park. Okay, now here on the side of the transaxle uh, is where our shift motor actuator assembly connects up. So just like the second generation Prius, we have an electric motor, a um, brushless motor that comes in right here. It automatically figures out what position it's in when you um, turn the key on. It has some uh, unique bolts and bolt covers. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly why uh, they do this. Um, the only thing I can think of is that it, it's for uh, safety when working on the, the vehicle itself. So let me get the, the last bolt in here. If you look at the bolt ends here on the shift actuator control uh, assembly, we've got the, the bolts that go through the bracket that hold it in place, but notice those bolts are in kind of a sleeve here. And that sleeve has a, a plug that goes over the top of it that prevents you from getting to the bolt unless you break that uh, little plug out of the top of the top of the sleeve. And the, the P610, the, the brand new one, has special twist off bolts that uh, once you put them in, you can't get them out unless you uh, go through a special uh, procedure to come in sideways with a hand wrench. And like I said, the only thing I can think of the reason for that uh, would be to prevent somebody from accidentally taking the shift uh, control actuator assembly off the transaxle uh, while it's in park and maybe not properly uh, blocked as far as blocking the wheels, blocking the vehicle from rolling. Uh, maybe this would make them think twice, or make it harder to remove. I don't know. Maybe if one of you guys know, you can uh, let me know. All right, so we've got our parking linkage, parking pole, our shift actuator uh, control motor, and our oil pump screen. Um, installed in the the side case here now the on the other side of this uh, center case is where the mg2 stator assembly goes and the mg2 stator for the p410 transaxle as you can see here is a much smaller stator than the one from the first and second generation prius the p111 and the p112 transaxle it's it's more narrow and mg2 the rotor itself is is much smaller uh, it has actually lower power but i'll explain to you uh, here in a little while uh, how that actually gives us uh, more torque through a, a planetary gear set uh, so anyway as i mentioned in the f the first video on the p111 transaxle you never want to lay one of these stators on their side it can damage the uh, insulation on all of these copper wires and cause a short circuit uh, to occur and that would short out one of the three phases there's three coils of wire in here they're just wound all over the place evenly spaced um, short one of those out and that would cause the vehicle to as you try to drive it um, just kind of be real jerky jerk 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 jer jer as you're driving uh, and it would slow way down you'd barely be able to drive uh, because one of the three phases of pulling the rotor 
uh, around would be uh, totally shorted out. As a matter of fact, it would be two phases um, if you look at the wiring diagram because two of them are used at the same time. Okay, so we're going to put the stator assembly in the center case here. There's also a junction block that has to poke through the holes there for the three-phase wiring to connect to the cables. So we've got some high voltage three-phase cables here. These are the small diameter wires. Um, they actually look smaller than the second generation Prius uh, three-phase cabling. And I believe they are because the voltage on this transaxle uh, has been stepped up to 650 volts rather than the 500 that we had on the second uh, generation uh, Prius transaxle. So before we can put the stator in, we have to put this, this junction block here on the, the end of the uh, transaxle. It has an electrical connector for the uh, stator temperature sensor. We'll take a look at that here in a moment. And then of course, the three phase uh, wiring connections on the inside for the stator and the three phase cable connections on the outside for the high voltage cables. So that goes on here. There's a weather seal underneath this thing to keep moisture from uh, intruding. All right, I'm not torquing any of these bolts because uh, the more times I have it apart and put it back together, the uh, more likely it is that the aluminum threads will uh, strip out. And when we use this for uh, classroom training here at our in our automotive program here at Weber State. All right, so let's take the the MG2 stator. And remember, MG2 is what moves the vehicle down the road. And we'll lift it up, keep it parallel with the case the best we can. And slide it in. Uh, we also have to rotate it one way or the other to line the bolt holes up. And you can visually look down there and see if they're lined up. So we'll get those bolts started. This uh, stator, by the way, um, being smaller, of course, doesn't weigh as much. Remember the P111 uh, transaxle on the first generation Prius, this stator weighed uh, 60 pounds, just a hair under 60 pounds. Um, This one weighs considerably less. But it is heavy enough that I need a block of wood under the transaxle case to keep it from tipping over. Okay, so now if you look right in here, you can see the, the three-phase cabling connections that need to be made with the, the three smaller nuts or bolts. And then we've got this temperature sensor for the stator that plugs into the same uh, pass-through connector right here on the case. So we'll put that on next. I'll plug in the temperature sensor and get these bolts making or completing the electrical connection to the junction block. These bolts, the cable ends, the junction block, all need to be really clean where they make metal to metal contact and then of course torqued properly so that we don't have any voltage drops across poor connections 
uh, inside the junction block or any of the cable uh, connections uh, either. So there's our uh, stator installed. The only thing we need to do uh, to really do it right is to finish by torquing those. And then the three-phase cabling, you can see here on the side, there's another set of three wires, three wire connections right here where the three-phase cabling that connects it to the inverter converter uh, comes in and makes a connection. So here's the the three uh, wires that make a connection there with their weather seal. Just have it upside down. Yep. Okay, it comes in right there, and then we put the three bolts in right here. Okay, we'll put the three bolts in the uh, three-phase cables to the junction block. Get one started. Okay, as you can see, we've got the the three bolts connected there, and then the shield, electromagnetic shield, comes over the top of that and bolts to the connector also. And there's electromagnetic shielding uh, for the, all of these three-phase cabling uh, systems. To reduce electromagnetic uh, interference. All right, so we've got our three-phase cabling for MG2 that would go to the inverter converter assembly uh, and our electrical connection right here for the MG2 uh, temperature sensor. All right, so let's, I believe that's it for the center case. Yes, it is. Toyota service information tells you to use a couple of blocks of wood and put under this transaxle half as you tip it sideways. Um, I've decided that I like using case half bolts. Um, I just run them in uh, down to where the threads uh, disappear or just down far enough that if I tip the transaxle sideways, the windings for the MG2 stator here are still uh, protected. And also there are oil pump uh, pickup tube down here needs to be uh, protected. So all of these bolts had Loctite of some sort or some sort of thread lock on them when I took it apart. Of course, that thread lock needs to be replaced when you reassemble the transaxle. Um, it needs to not only be replaced, but it needs to be um, properly installed, which means I've got to back these out a little bit to protect our uh, windings. They got to stick out higher or farther than the windings. Um, to properly install the thread locking compound, you have to clean the bolt holes out, clean the threads out. They have to be clean and dry. The bolt needs to be clean and dry. And then there's a special primer accelerant that helps it set up more quickly. That's better. Okay. So now you can see I've got a space underneath here because of those uh, bolts. I'll do the same thing here on the the other case half or the other side of the case half where it mates with the bell housing to
to uh, protect this side of the park linkage and, and brackets and so on from damage. As I'm sure many of you know, it's a lot of work to clean off all that thread lock. But if you want to do a good job, a proper job, which is my job as an automotive instructor to teach my students how to do, uh, everything needs to be good, clean, dry, and properly uh, prepared. All right. Um, we are done with this, this case half. Let's move to the side cover with the oil pump. The side cover here with the oil pump uh, has a place for the MG2 resolver to bolt up. And if you recall, the resolver is the part that measures the rotational speed, direction of rotation, and position of the rotors that rotate and, and spin and move the, the vehicle down the road. Okay, so we will set the resolver uh, down in place. The resolver is a set of three coils of wire. One of the three coils of wire has a high frequency voltage uh, applied to it and then that induces uh, a voltage into the other two coils of wire that's proportional to the position of the MG2 rotor um, assembly. And I'll, I'll show you the um, the resolver rotor that uh, will strengthen or weaken the magnetic field that affects the overall uh, amount of induced voltage. All right, so this resolver here really should never be removed because it has to be factory calibrated so that it matches the actual position of the magnets on the rotor. If you must remove one of these, then you make a scratch mark on it versus the case, and then reinstall it in that same uh, position. So there's this bracket that the bolts go through to hold it in place. The bolts come through from the oil pump side If you forgot to mark the location of the resolver versus the side case here, there is a way where you can somewhat get it real close to where it should be. And that is, if you look through this hole here in that plug, or where I removed that plug, all right, you can see in this hole right here is the resolver. And I'm going to turn it And there's a notch right there. And maybe it's easier to see from, from this side. Yes, it is. So right here is this notch. Right here is the hole. And if you center that notch right there, the best you can over that hole, that's where, it, it, that's where the scratch marks uh, had it lining up uh, to begin with. So it can be adjusted way down or way far the other way. Put it dead center, look through the hole itself, line it up, because I'm sure that's where they make any fine tune adjustments. They come in and pry it one way or the other uh, for factory uh, calibration. All right, once that uh, resolver is in place, then we tighten up and torque the bolts for the resolver. They have seals underneath the bolts to keep fluid uh, from coming out. And then we've got the plug, clean it up good, put the red Loctite on it. This does not use a, an aluminum gasket. This is just the plug itself. So make sure everything is good and clean because you don't want any oil leaking out of that plug. All right, the next thing to install is our oil pump. The oil pump that's on this P410 transaxle is the same trochoid style pump that was on the P111 um, and 112 uh, transaxle. It's the same diameter, the same thickness. 
Here's the outer gear. Here's the inner gear. There's a punch mark on each one. Those are not alignment marks. Those are just up and down marks. And that sh uh, those marks were pointing up when uh, I took this apart. We have an oil pump drive shaft. We have a sealing ring that is going to seal the housing off and keep it from leaking. And then we have the housing. In the housing itself, there's a pressure relief valve that any excess oil pressure is just put back into the oil pump suction side. And we have an oil pressure tap where you can hook up an oil pressure gauge and go through a special procedure to make sure that you've got the right oil pressure. Now I've cut away part of this oil pump cover just so we can see the oil pump down inside and see that it rotates with the engine. It rotates with the crankshaft of the engine. So anytime the engine is running, this uh, trochoid pump is also uh, pumping fluid and cooling the stators and lubricating all the bearings and gears in the, in the transaxle. All right, so there's our, our pump installed right there, our oil pump drive that has some flat ends on it, uh, comes up and it needs to be aligned with the pump uh, rotor, the center gear itself. If you don't align that before you put this shaft in, uh, everything will not line up. So here we, here we have it installed. In other words, don't put the, the pump on until after you have the cover installed and the drive shaft for the pump installed and then put it together. Otherwise it won't clear or you may not get the gears to line up to where you can even put the, the oil pump drive shaft through. All right, the last thing uh, here on the, the back cover is the electrical connector that hooks to the MG2 resolver. So we'll push through the electrical harness. The harnesses on these Toyota transaxles always poke through just a little bit, just enough that you can plug on the electrical connector plug. And then with a lubricated O-ring, line that up and torque the bolt to specification. Okay. So we've got the center case assembled and we've got the, the side cover uh, assembled. I'm just going to set this right here for now to get it out of the way. Now we have the most interesting part and that is the bell housing uh, portion of the the case. Let's bring that over and take a look at just a couple of more things. I couldn't show it to you before because I had the case standing on end. But you can see right here is our transaxle fluid level check plug. So, and here's our fill plug where you put oil in. And our drain plug is down here. So if you want to check the fluid level on your Prius uh, transaxle, as part of the oil level checking procedure, uh, you are going to remove this plug. With this plug removed, under the whatever conditions, um, engine running, engine off, I forget what it is on this transaxle exactly, but if there's too much fluid in the transaxle, fluid will come out of this hole. If there's not enough fluid in it, then you take this plug out and add fluid down in. The problem with taking this plug out is there might be dirt and garbage right here that would uh, fall down inside the transmission. So clean that up really well. If you can't get to this, then add fluid through the fluid level check plug and um, keep adding it until it comes back out. And when it comes out, just let it sit there and drip until it's done dripping and then your fluid level uh, would be correct. I'm pretty sure the engine has to be off uh, on this, this model to uh, check the fluid level. 
if my memory serves me correctly. All right, so let's look at the front bell housing area right here. This is where the MG1 rotor assembly uh, goes. Now the MG1 rotor, remember, is the part that is responsible for starting the internal combustion engine when needed. And it's also the generator that as it rotates, it recharges the high voltage battery in the back of the car and provides power to the MG2 rotor to propel the vehicle uh, down the road. So this, this rotor um, on the top of it has, on the top of this, you can see right here, there's a, a kind of a, a double cam looking piece. That is the resolver rotor, the resolver rotor. And that piece, as this rotor spins around, moves out and back like a camshaft does on an engine and will change the magnetic reluctance of the uh, resolver and let it know where the position of the magnets are that are in this uh, rotor itself. Now this rotor has been redesigned over the previous rotor in the P112 transaxle from the second generation Prius. It's been highly balanced uh, also and it has a maximum RPM now of 13,500 RPM where the second generation Prius was at 10,000. The first generation Prius was at 6,500. So now we're at 13,500. So this resolver has the same issue. It must never be removed uh, without marking the relationship of the resolver to the uh, case. Otherwise you'll lose the synchronization of the pulses of the stator assembly to the rotor assembly. So this sits in here, right there. There's a bracket that goes over it right here to hold it in place. And then the, the three bolts, which only two of them are showing here since I cut away uh, part of the case for this demonstration. Holds, these two bolts hold the resolver in place. And just like on that back cover, there's a hole right here for the resolver uh, position. And the little notch in the resolver needs to be lined up as close to that hole, the center of that hole as possible. I'm off just a little bit. There we go. But that's only if you forgot to mark the relationship of the rotor to the, or of the resolver to the case. Now there's no way to externally make this, or adjust this. So if you mess this up, uh, it may not work at all without you going back inside and <laughs> um, making some sort of a, uh, partial disassembly and, and readjust the, the best you can. So the word, once again, the word to the wise is to not remove the, um, the resolvers. All right, so the, re, the resolver harness sticks up through here for the electrical connection for the MG1 um, three-phase wiring. There's a bracket and a lubrication pipe right here that will hold that harness in place and keep it from contacting the rotating uh, rotor and interfering with the rotation or the installation of the MG1 stator. So now you can see We've got this bracket. It also is a, not a lubrication pipe, but a cooling pipe. So this pipe right here 
turn it sideways so you can see it a little bit. That's going to pump fluid, or fluid's going to be pumped out of that hole, and it's going to drip down on the MG1 stator assembly. So let me bring the stator assembly over here. Okay, so here's our MG1 stator assembly. And if you recall from the P111 transaxle, it had a stator assembly that was encased in some sort of a resin housing, just like this. But the second generation Prius, the transaxle, the P112 did not. It just had exposed wires on the stator, just like the MG2 stator does in this transaxle. Uh, but this one has the encased um, stator. It also has a hole right here for the stator temperature sensor. You can see that hole right there. And that stator temperature sensor is on the harness right here that is the same harness that the resolver uh, connects to. So now we're going to take the MG1 rotor assembly with its two cammed, two cam lobe uh, resolver rotor right here and set it down through the resolver and into the bearing where it sits. And it just slides right down just like that. And this spins, of course, uh, as I mentioned before, to start the internal combustion engine and recharge the battery and provide power for the MG2 rotor. Now there's a cover that goes on top here. Let's bring the, the cover over. I've cut a chunk out of the cover so we can uh, have a cutaway view of the transaxle itself, but as you can see, it has a bearing that'll center and, and support the MG1 rotor, and then of course a seal uh, for our input shaft to connect to the flywheel uh, damper assembly. Um, the FIPIG, you can see sort of this pinkish uh, colored sealant right there, uh, needs to be all cleaned off before you reseal uh, the cover. It needs to seal out um, transmission fluid from leaking. And you can see inside the case here, and I've left this on purpose, the leftover uh, FIPIG from before. All of that needs to be cleaned off. And it's a real difficult thing to clean it all off without damaging the, the surface there. I use a really sharp, flat razor blade uh, with the blade pointing straight down, and I just kind of scrape uh, and cleaned it off, and then just a tiny bit of brake clean uh, to clean the rest of it off. Um, so we would clean that off and then set this cover right down here on the, the rotor assembly, just like that. And then we've got, of course, all the bolts that hold it in place. Now, unlike the first two generations of the Prius transaxle, there is no cooling circle uh, cooling passage circle that goes around the outside of this uh, housing. Uh, this big gap that's in here, of course, is where the, the MG1 stator would sit, but I can't put that stator in there. Even if I cut it away, I can't put the stator in there because the magnetic uh, field strength is so strong that I cannot rotate the MG1 uh, rotor as I need to uh, during my demonstration. So I leave MG1 uh, stator out. By the way, this transaxle is about nine millimeters uh, th narrower than the first uh, and second generation uh, transaxles, and it is also uh, weighing in at 202.8 pounds versus 236 pounds on the previous uh, generation transaxle. So we lost uh, 34 pounds approximately of weight going to this smaller, uh, more efficient uh, transaxle. Uh, but we went up in uh, torque and horsepower on this transaxle and better efficiency, uh, fuel economy and, and so on. 
Okay, so we've got the MG1 rotor installed, got its cover on, and now we're ready to uh, turn it over and look at the other side of the case. Uh, right here on the on the top of the transaxle by the vent is where the junction block for the other uh, three-phase cables for MG1 go. So here's the junction block. We've got a pass-through connector for the MG1 resolver and the MG1 temperature sensor. So we'll get that plugged in and installed. Let's see. There's Get the bolts in the right locations. Some of the bolt holes here are for the electromagnetic shield. Remember there's a some sort of a seal under there, so you need to take it down uh, evenly. And we did not install the MG1 stator, so I'm just going to put on the uh, cover without bolting down the three-phase cables because there's nothing to uh, connect them to at the moment. Let me tip the case up on its side here. We've got the final drive ring gear that's going to fit or goes right in this space here. And as this ring gear rotates, it flings oil up into oil catch uh, areas to drip down to lubricate bearings and, and uh, gears and, and so on. Um, there is a little shield, kind of a lubrication dam. that goes right here to help guide and retain some of the fluid in the proper location. Okay, we are ready to install the gears and the MG2 uh, rotor and talk about how this new design P410 transaxle has evolved into a better a design that gets better fuel economy, is more efficient, and actually has a lot more power than the P112 transaxle in the second uh, generation Prius. So, uh, to do that, uh, let's look at the, the components one by one. Of course, we've got the, the rotor, MG1 rotor here. MG1 stands for motor generator number one, which is our starter and generator. Uh, it starts the internal combustion engine. It provides power to MG2 right here to help move the vehicle down the road. And any excess power is routed to the 201.6 volt battery, same as in the second generation Prius, uh, in the back of the, the vehicle. It's a nickel metal hydride uh, battery. Um, just like in the first and second generation uh, Prius transaxles, the rotor, MG1 rotor, drives a sun gear. So if that rotor uh, rotates at all, it turns a sun gear uh, of a planetary gear set. Now, uh, there's three pieces to a, three main components to a planetary gear set. A sun gear is one of them, and it is in the center and, of course, uh, rotates. The second piece is the planet carrier. Now this piece right here is the planet carrier and this sun gear would fit right up inside of it just like that. Um, but the planet carrier on the Prius or on all Toyota uh, hybrid transaxles uh, is connected to the internal combustion engine through a clutch damper, which limits the maximum amount of torque transferred from the engine to the transaxle or backwards from the transaxle 
back to the engine, there's a clutch that will actually slip in here if there's if the torque is, maximum torque is exceeded. And then of course there's a flywheel that uh, bolts to the engine crankshaft and rotates at engine crankshaft speed. So out of the three pieces of a planetary gear set, we've got the sun gear that rotates with MG1, we've got the planet carrier that rotates with the engine, and then on the first and second generation Prius, MG2 right here was connected to the ring gear or internal gear. So here is a ring gear or internal gear as uh, it's called in, in many books. Sometimes it's called an annulus gear also, but it's the gear is on the inside here. And this on the first and second generation Priuses was hooked directly to uh, MG2. And MG2 is what's responsible for driving us down the road. We do not move down the road unless MG2 uh, moves. All right. So in the first and second generation uh, Prius, that's all we had was those three pieces. Well, in this third generation Prius uh, and this P410 uh, transaxle, which remember is a baby version of the P310, 311, 312, 13, and 14 transaxles that are used in other uh, Toyota hybrid, hybrid vehicles like the uh, Camry, the RAV4, the Avalon. Um, they all use a, a version of this also that's just bigger, heavier, 267 pounds, um, more heavy duty, more, more torque, more power. But the, for this smaller version here for the Prius, um, the, obviously that's the one we're we're looking at today so um, what they've done here in this new design is add a second planetary gear set so instead of just one planetary gear set which was called the power split device in the first and second generation uh, Prius we now have a second planetary gear set called the motor speed reduction gear set so let's uh, the, so we can understand how that works let's take our flywheel and get it in place here where it goes it'll spin with the engine we'll take our planet carrier make sure it's got its bearings yes it does get it lined up and into the flywheel. Notice neither one of these are directly connected to each other. The flywheel is not connected to MG1. MG1 is not connected to the flywheel. They can rotate around each other. Um, and if we rotate both of them the same speed, then they're the same speed and direction, then they're locked up and act as one. Uh, and can contribute torque to MG2 as we drive down the road. Um, and then we can play with the rotational speed of MG1 to vary how much engine torque is uh, added to the torque of MG2's uh, rotor anyway. All right, so there's a ring gear or internal gear that goes right here. And what they've done to add a second planetary gear set in this P410 transaxle is they've combined both ring gears into one housing. So the ring gear here on the bottom is the ring gear for the MG1 uh, rotor and the engine itself. That's the power split device ring gear. Here on the other side, we have another ring gear or internal gear for the motor speed reduction gear set. And so this whole thing just sits right down in there, just like that. All right, so from here down, we have the power split device that basically is determining how much power is added to uh, move the vehicle down the road. This gear right here on the outside of this set of uh, ring gears is what connects to the K 
counter drive gear and the final drive gear. So on this uh, third generation Prius, the P410 transaxle, they got rid of that drive sprocket chain and driven sprocket and counter drive gear and counter driven gear uh, and final drive gear mess. And now they just have a counter drive gear, a counter driven gear and the final drive. That's it. So to install the counter uh, driven gear here and the final drive, both of them kind of have to go in at the same time. There's a, it's a real tight space. Um, if I set the final drive gear almost all the way in place and kind of tilt it like that, then I can come in with the, the counter driven gear get it lined up with its bore the weight of the ring gear pulling down on the bearing on this side is tilting the the gear this way and putting a bind on the bearing all right i don't like hammers as i've described in previous uh, videos especially pounding down uh, because we can damage uh, the bearing surfaces and the bearings themselves and cause brindling. But if we tap sideways, it's getting there. There we go. Then we're just lining the, the bearing up with the case and the chances of causing bearing damage and brindling is it's much lower. Uh, the, the tendency, of course, is to pound down. Pounding down on it does not uh, help anything at all. It just wedges it uh, in place. All right, so let's come back to our, our gear train here. So the two ring gears that are right here uh, for the two planetary gear sets have an external drive gear called the counter drive gear. And notice if it rotates, Notice that the final drive gear back over here also is rotating. So if we can make the, this ring gear rotate at all, then the vehicle will move. Now we can make that ring gear rotate through the engine side by turning the engine and then dragging the, uh, or not dragging, but affecting the rotational speed of MG1 we can send torque to the, the bottom side as it's positioned here, the engine side of that ring gear and make the vehicle uh, move. So we've got a torque path uh, coming that way. But if the vehicle is stopped and we run the engine, then we're just turning the MG1 rotor uh, generating. But driving down the road, we can turn these two at exactly the same speed, the flywheel and the MG1 rotor that would connect engine torque to this gear and drive it down the road. So that's, that's one possibility, uh, but it's never done, it never does that by itself. It always has to have MG2 uh, moving the vehicle down the road as the primary source of power. Now, um, here on the, the top ring gear here, which is called the um, Motor Speed Reduction Gear Set, it has another planetary gear set. So right here on the, the MG2 rotor, we have a sun gear that has 22 teeth. We have a planet carrier right here, a, a, another planet gear, like the planet gear that connects to the uh, flywheel here. Uh, and it has uh, 18 teeth, and then the ring gear has 58. By the way, the, the bottom planetary gear set here, the planetary, or I'm sorry, the power split device, the sun gear has 30 teeth, the planet gears are 23, and the ring gear is 78, if you want to do the math, and come up with a, a gear ratio of 2.6 to 1 uh, from MG1 to the ring gear, um, and then a gear ratio of 2.636 to 1 from MG2 to the drive gear here on the, there we go. So this planet carrier sits down inside of that upper 
ring gear, the motor speed reduction ring gear. This planet carrier has five planet gears. The more planet gears there are, the more torque it is designed to handle. And this is going to have to handle a lot of torque because this transaxle is designed um, to give a lot more torque than we had on the previous uh, design transaxle. Now, as this label shows right here, this planet carrier is held stationary. In other words, it does not rotate. It's held absolutely still um, by a notch in, by notches in the case of this uh, center case half here. So if we tip this up on its side and look right here, all of these notches right there, those, those notches line up with these notches and hold the planet carrier from rotating. So it is, it is held solid as we drive down the road. All right, the last piece of the puzzle here is the MG2 rotor assembly itself. Um, if we compare that to the MG2 rotor of uh, the previous two transaxles, it's about half the height. Um, it's a little bit larger in diameter. Uh, it has the uh, V-shaped uh, magnets. It's also rated for 207 Newton meters of torque or 153 pound-feet of torque. And this sun gear right here fits right down inside of that motor speed reduction uh, gear set. Now, if we compare that to the second generation transaxle as far as the power ratings, let's see, we've got 80 horsepower and 153 pound-feet of torque. The second generation transaxle has 68 horsepower and 295 pound-feet of torque. So at first glance, you might think that uh, the 68 horsepower uh, of course is lower for the second generation but the 295 pound-feet of torque on the second generation is much higher than the 153 we have here on the third but you've got to remember we now have another planetary gear set for gear reduction uh, here on this third generation uh, transaxle so what happens is we have to take that torque of 250 or of 153 uh, pound-feet of torque and multiply it by the gear ratio of 2.636 and we come up with 403 pound-feet of torque delivered to this ring gear from MG2. Now that does not take into account any frictional losses from the, the gears contacting each other. That's just theoretical maximum torque. So it's going to be a little less than the 403, but it's a lot more than the 298 that we had on the MG2 of the second generation transaxle. So the horsepower went from 68 horsepower up to 80. The theoretical maximum torque went from 295 pound-feet of torque to 403 pound-feet of torque. And I can tell you from owning a second or third generation Prius myself uh, for two years that it had plenty of uh, acceleration. It was, it was very fun uh, to drive. Notice the forward direction of rotation on, on this uh, MG2 now is backwards of what it was on MG1 and that's because instead of using two counter gears we're only using one counter gear uh, but if we rotate the MG2 rotor this direction the vehicle uh, will move forward if we hold this motor speed reduction gear set planet carrier from rotating so one of the guys here at the shop built a little bracket for me to hold the uh, planet carrier from rotating while I do demonstrations like this. Just a little metal bar that comes in uh, from the back here, goes into one of the notches. Now the, the planet carrier is stationary. And so now let's, let's watch the final drive uh, gear here uh, rotate. 
Um, because of the additional gear reduction here uh, in the motor speed reduction gear set of 2.636 to 1, it's going to take more rotations of MG2's rotor to get one rotation of the final drive, which equals the rotational speed of the tires. So this time, this with through all these gears, it's going to take 8.6 turns of MG2 to get one rotation of the uh, final drive here. So let's let's check that out. Notice the the sticker location here. So let's let's make this rotate one time. So here we go. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and eight point six is about half, a little more than half over here, and our sticker is back to where it was. So that means this MG2 rotor did not slow down, it sped up. So the name of this second gear set here, the motor speed reduction gear set, makes no sense to me. It, it drove me crazy uh, for, for quite a while, thinking, why would they call it a motor speed reduction gear set? Uh, because all the uh, descriptions in the Toyota surface, inf surface information say it's to reduce the speed of MG2. Well, obviously it doesn't. It, it sped it up by a factor of 2.6. Um, so, uh, instead, after playing with these transaxles and, and do, doing calculations, what it does is it reduces the speed of MG1. I believe there's a typographical error in the Toyota service information that's just been propagated on and on and on. And what happens is, uh, while you're driving down the road, um, in the first and second generation Prius, uh, well, in the first generation Prius, this rotor... MG1 rotor had a maximum speed of 6,500 RPM. And in the second generation Prius, it went to 10,000 RPM. In this third generation Prius, it's at 13,500 RPM. By the way, in the fourth generation, it's at 17,000. But as you are driving down the road in electric vehicle mode, EV mode with the engine off, um, it has a gear ratio here of 1.014 turns of MG1 to one turn of MG2. In other words, they spin almost exactly the same speed. We are not going to over rev in EV mode MG1. So on the second generation, first and second generation transaxle, they had a gear ratio of 2.6 turns of MG1 to just one turn of MG2, which meant in EV mode, you could not drive very fast without exceeding or meeting the maximum RPM of MG1. And the only way to slow it down was to start the engine and have the engine affect the rotational speed of MG1 and even the rotational direction of MG1. So <laughs> the motor speed reduction gear set, in my opinion, is to reduce the speed of MG1 rather than MG2. The power rating, the torque rating of MG2 went down, but the through the torque multiplication that takes place through gear reduction, we increased the torque over the previous design, and our and our horsepower rating uh, is higher. We have an MG1 gear ratio to MG2 gear ratio of just a little over one turn, 1.014 turns. So as I turn MG2 one rotation this will turn a little more than one rotation, 1.014 uh, rotations. And once again, that would only occur in electric vehicle mode, uh, like in, a, in the plug-in, the 2012 through 2015 plug-in Prius, the plug-in hybrid uh, vehicle. In EV mode, you could drive clear up to 61 and a half miles an hour before the engine had to come on and I'm sure that had something to do with the rotational speed of MG1 uh, and how much energy it took to even propel the vehicle down the road uh, in MG2 versus the current uh, availability in um, or from the battery itself. So uh, if I punch in, I've, I've done some calculations here. If I punch in 61 and a half miles an hour, um, with an engine speed of zero for the P410 transaxle here, the 
MG2 rotational speed is at 7,400 RPM. It's 7,400 RPM at 61 and a half miles an hour. Uh, MG2, or I'm sorry, MG1 is at 7,800 RPM, which is nowhere near the maximum of 13,500. So it's not because of over revving. It's because, uh, it's got to be because of, it, we need more energy to propel the vehicle faster with the wind resistance and rolling resistance of the tires and so on. Um, okay, so the last uh, piece of the puzzle here is our oil pump drive and it splines to the planetary uh, carrier that hooks to the crankshaft of, of the engine. So notice as I turn the flywheel, the oil pump drive gear uh, rotates also. So let's just do a an overall summary of the operation of the P410 transaxle here with its two planetary gear sets. So we've got the internal combustion engine through the flywheel that connects to the planet carrier um, of the of the power split device planetary gear set. It still has the same gear ratio between the flywheel and MG1 that the first and second generation Priuses uh, did of 3.6 turns to one. In other words, if I stop MG2 from rotating and I rotate the, the crankshaft, MG1 spins 3.6 times faster than the engine does. And that's the faster that spins, the more power is generated to recharge the, the battery. That's why your engine cycles on and off. Uh, your battery power, high voltage battery power get, goes down low, it starts the engine, this powers up and recharges it and then shuts back, shuts back off. Um, the engine in combination with MG1 can contribute torque to this outer gear here in this set of ring gears for the two planetary gear sets. But the number one source of torque for moving the vehicle down the road is MG2 through the motor speed reduction uh, gear set. And notice if I turn MG2 at all, either direction, if I move MG2, this gear is moving. Uh, so MG2 is what moves the vehicle down the road. Notice that if I tr hold this the ring gear from rotating, I can turn the crankshaft, I can turn MG1, neither one of those force the engine to or force the gear to rotate and move the vehicle down the road. They can only contribute torque to the ring gear, which is what MG2 is is driving anyway. Now a few uh, th uh, theoretical uh, things about the about a planetary gear set and that is if you turn any two components the exact same speed, you lock up the entire planetary gear set and uh, it all turns as one assembly. So in other words, if I lock the sun gear, which is connected to the MG1 rotor, to the flywheel, if I turn these two together, notice that the ring gear, the third piece, rotates with it. So if we lock these two, or not lock them, but if we rotate, if we cause MG1 to rotate electrically the same speed as the engine RPM, we are delivering all of the engine torque right to this gear to help MG2 uh, propel the vehicle down the road. If we don't lock them together and we have some slip, then we're delivering less than full engine torque or whatever the torque is at that engine RPM to MG2. So we can we can make it be absolutely nothing, which is what it is right here, to a, a full maximum, which is what it is when we hook the two together. It's a variable. It's a electronically continuously variable transmission as far as the engine RPM to the drive of the transaxle itself. All right. Um, so let's slide that out of the way. We are just about done. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the inverter 
converter assembly. This inverter converter assembly, as you can see, is quite small. This would be the front of the vehicle. If you open the hood on your uh, third generation uh, Prius, this will be on the driver's side right in the front. You'll recognize this black cover. We've got the two cables coming in from the high voltage battery in the back. We've got two sets of three cables going out to the MG1 and the MG2 rotors that we just uh, learned about. We have um, some high voltage uh, cables that come out right here to go to, to the electric air conditioning compressor, which by the way, the first electric air conditioning compressor on a Prius was the second generation uh, Prius. We just carried it over into the third uh, generation. And then we have our DC to DC converter where we take the high voltage 201 uh, 0.6 volt uh, battery voltage from the, the back uh, of the vehicle and turn it down to approximately 14 volts to charge the auxiliary battery uh, in the back of the vehicle uh, there also. Which by the way, hopefully you know that there's a jump start terminal under the hood. You do not have to get clear in the back of the vehicle to open the hatch to uh, jump start your vehicle if you end up with a dead 12 volt battery but the rest of the car runs on 12 volts it's just the the air conditioning compressor and the transaxle that run on the the high voltage and on this model the high voltage with all these parts spinning at their at their speeds could be as high as 650 volts on these three phase cables so a much smaller uh, converter this converter inverter converter weighs about 15 pounds less than the first and second generation Priuses. They both weighed around 44 pounds. Uh, this one's about 29 uh, pounds. Much smaller. All right, well, that is the P410 transaxle for the third generation Prius. In our next episode, we are going to look at the P510 transaxle, which was used in the Prius C. And then finally, after that, we will get into the brand new P610 transaxle that's used in the 2016 and above Prius and the 2017 Prius Prime. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.